by any measure, accomplishment, service, courage. John Glenn was a great man. When I think of John Glenn, I think of a good man. My first taste of John Glenn, the good man, was on March 4th, 1968, at the Madison Theater in Mansfield, Ohio. 50 teenage boys had gathered for our Eagle Scout dinner. Colonel Glenn was the speaker. John Glenn, national hero, shook hands with each one of us. John Glenn, perhaps the most famous man of his generation, took a picture with us one at a time. He always made time for you, no matter your station in life. That lesson has stuck with me. 39 years later, former Senator John Glenn walked me down the center aisle of the United States Senate to be sworn in. And of course, like the Eagle Scouts of four decades earlier, all the new senators wanted to meet their American hero. And he was kind to senators too. <laughs> I had the honor to see John Glenn up close at work and at play with family and with strangers. Every presidential year, Ohio's most prominent Democrat would board a bus with our presidential or vice presidential nominee to campaign around Ohio. I watched the retired senator, a mentor to so many of us, reconnect with Senator Kerry in 2004, with Senator Biden in 2008. I saw him for the first time, I was sitting on the bus with him, meet the young senator from Illinois and the immediate connection that the American icon and the future president made. At one stop, this was a decade after his retirement from the Senate, John Glenn got off the bus, jumped over a ditch, and shook the outstretched hand of an appreciative farmer. He was there, John was there in non-presidential years for Ohio Democrats too. In 2006, we boarded a, shall we say, old, shall we say older, less opulent Winnebago with the Ohio Democratic ticket to campaign through small town in rural Ohio. As we traveled up and down and over the hills of John's beloved, John and Annie's beloved Southeast Ohio, the rest of us began to get car sick. But of course, not the 85-year-old astronaut who simply smiled at us. And I saw the elder statesman as he'd get off the bus and speak to one adoring crowd after another, transferring some of his magic to us. John was an FDR Democrat. Roosevelt saved America, after all, John said. An FDR Democrat who cared about justice and cared about opportunity for people with less privilege than most of us in this room have. He never forgot, as Dave talked about, he never forgot the terror that struck his 10 or 11-year-old heart when he overheard his parents saying that their home was about to be foreclosed upon. It was a New Deal government-backed FHA loan that allowed John's father to renegotiate with the bank and keep his family in their home. John knew, as he later wrote in his memoir, that government can change people's lives for the better. Some say that John's brand of patriotic optimism is a throwback to a bygone era, but we need it now more than ever. John believed in an activist government and an active citizenship. He warned, that citizen, that he warned that cynicism and apathy were a threat to democracy itself. John's friend, Robert Kennedy, who helped to convince him to run for the Senate, said that politics was a, was a calling almost like the ministry. Presbyterian John liked those words. The happiest and most fulfilled people I've known, he told us, are those who devoted themselves to something bigger and more profound than their own self-interest. That, that drove John's activism and his public service. It drove him to create the Glenn Institute, becoming the Glenn School, becoming the Glenn College, to inspire the next generation of active, engaged citizens. A friend who worked for John 30 years ago in his Senate office told me this week, John Glenn took, took such joy in helping others and was so proud of his staff, even when you left, you were still family. John Glenn was the only Ohioan ever to be elected four times to the United States Senate. He was a workhorse, never a show horse. He labored over the, over the details of nonproliferation 
and environmental cleanup of nuclear disposal sites, grunt work to some, but John was content to spend his time not on collecting instant headlines, but achieving lasting results that would leave the world better than he had found it. He helped create the independent watchdogs we know as inspectors general to keep the government he believed in accountable to the people it serves. He had the foresight to found the Great Lakes Task Force, which continues to play such an important role to protect the health of our Great Lake. The night before the 50th anniversary of Colonel Glenn's space launch, Connie and I had dinner in German Village with Annie and John and Lynn and David and Karen. As the evening wound down, we headed to the door together. The valet pulled up in front of the restaurant with John's Cadillac. The 91-year-old astronaut hopped in the driver's seat, Annie in the front seat, and the kids, now all on the other side of 60, piled in the back. Some things just never change. <laughs> and oh, how they were in love, Annie and John. I spoke with Annie in April, on their, on, called them on their 75th wedding anniversary. She told me they had waited to get married until after John finished his flight training. We wanted to get married in high school, Annie said, but our parents wouldn't let, it, let us because they said it would never last. <laughs> and how they loved David and Lynn as we saw today. John had a way of making everyone around him feel important from the teenage Eagle Scouts to the farmers in the field. He lived his life by Matthew 25, where Jesus admonished his followers, whenever you did it, for any of my people, no matter how unimportant they seemed, you did it for me. John Glenn, a great man. John Glenn, such a good man. He's still handy that way, Annie. <laughs> Four years ago, John and Annie entered the hotel suite we had reserved for election night and were immediately swarmed by awestruck admirers. This is how it was with those two always, and I've never known them to be anything but gracious with strangers. In the wake of my essay about John for The Plain Dealer, I've been on the receiving end of a steady stream of stories about random encounters with John and Annie. Every one of those stories has a happy ending. On that night in 2012, our four-year-old grandson Clayton was with us. He had spent much of the day rehearsing a question he wanted to ask John. I introduced him and I told John that Clayton had something on his mind. Immediately, tall, lanky John leaned in so that he could talk face to face with our little boy. What's your question, John said. Clayton didn't hesitate. How do astronauts go to the bathroom in space? <laughs> John smiled. Well now, that's an interesting question, isn't it? Clayton nodded and those of us within earshot gathered round for astronaut John Glenn's 10 minute tutorial <laughs> on the machinations of urination in space. After he finished, Clayton thanked him and shook his hand and started making the rounds to share his new ex expertise. I hugged John and I thanked him for treating Clayton with such respect. Well, why wouldn't I, he said. Children have sincere questions and they deserve sincere answers. Clayton is eight years old now and we visited him just last weekend and one of the first things he said to me was, <clears throat> I'm sorry you lost your friend, Grandma. He was my friend, too. Last week, Sheridan and I learned from Lynn that our beloved friend was dying. Lynn, we will never forget the kindness you showed us by asking us to send you text messages that you could read to your father. Thank you for that. Sherrod was in Washington, as you know. I was in Austin. I had just landed in Texas. Thank you. <clears throat> 
In my message, I reminded John of that conversation he'd had with our grandson, and I told him I've lost count of the number of times I've shared that story as an illustration of what we gain when we engage with civility. If American icon John Glenn could take the time to treat a child with such respect, surely we can find ways to listen to one another. One of my most enduring memories of John as a friend and mentor involves his two-pronged sense of empathy and timing. He and Annie sat behind me during one of Sherrod's campaign debates in 2012. And when Sherrod's opponent called him a liar, John's hands immediately pressed on my shoulders to keep me in my seat. <laughs> he leaned in and he whispered, me too, but not now. <laughs> John was a man of his time who kept up with the times. Never was that more obvious to me than when he encouraged me to keep writing and sharing my opinions. I once joked with John and Annie that I had flunked political wife training. Neither of them laughed. Instead, Annie grabbed one of my hands and John grabbed the other. Listen to me, he said in a stern voice. You are who you are and that is why we love you. Annie squeezed my hand and added, never stop speaking your mind. I will never forget the way John turned and locked eyes with Annie. Listen to my Annie, he said. I always do. That is the part of John Glenn that we must not lose in all these tributes. He loved his wife, he loved his Annie, and he never tired of letting everyone know. One afternoon, we visited their apartment with actor Martin Sheen, who was in Ohio to campaign for Sherrod. John was excited, as excited to see West Wing's President Bartlett <laughs> as Martin was to see astronaut John Glenn who had recently won the Presidential Medal of Freedom. When it was time for all of us to leave for a fundraising event, John held out his elbow for Annie. Annie had other plans. Annie, Martin said, grinning in that impish way of his, may I escort you? Annie looped her arm around his and smiled at John. <laughs> we'll see you when you get there. John turned to me in mock horror. Did you see that? She just dumped me. <laughs> he stood in the doorway and watched her walk the length of the hallway, beaming like a boyfriend. The last time Sherrod and I spent time alone with John and Annie was at their apartment here in Columbus. As soon as I sat down on the couch, John pointed to where I was seated and said to Annie, she's sitting where Hillary sat. And until that moment, neither us nor certainly any member of the media had known that Hillary had just stopped by to visit. For more than an hour, about the pres we talked about the presidential race and we talked about the future of our country, but we also swapped stories about our children and our grandchildren. John was a bit slower, but only in movement. His mind was sharp as ever. As we prepared to leave, he made clear to us in his engineer's voice that he knew time was running out. You can only replace the parts so long, he said, putting a hand on each of our shoulders. Eventually, you need a new chassis. We were quiet on that elevator ride back to the lobby, each of us taking in what John was telling us. Once again, our friend was answering the question, the question, this one unspoken, as honestly as he could. One last time, John Glenn was leading the way. Annie? I am here as your friend, too, and as a fellow political wife. How you and I have laughed over the years at that silly definition of who we are. We didn't marry politics. We married the men we love. You once told me that John was your hero, too, but for reasons far more personal and meaningful than the public could ever know. Well, John knew, Annie. Once over dinner, in a room packed with his admirers, I mentioned to John how inspiring your marriage is to me. He leaned in and with the softest eyes said, oh, Connie, I am who I am because of Annie. We love you, Annie.